I think we'll have a little fun as well. So that's good. <laughs> I got my Fly Sky High ready. Yeah, I know. That's why I got on my laptop so I could get Fly Sky High on the side. Yes. Yeah. I, if there's time, can we also cover how to do tasks? How on Fly Sky High? It's like I've tried to put waypoints before, but they, I don't know. It's, I'm sure there's just getting used to it, but I, it always like points somewhere way off in the distance that I don't understand. <laughs> um, well, one thing that Fly Sky High does is it, it stubbornly puts you where you are right now. So if you're sitting at home uh, and you want to set up a task at Brace Mountain, it will continue to revert you to Brooklyn <laughs> or wherever you are. And you'll see this long arrow going toward Brace Mountain. So it might be as simple as that. It, it um it does work quite well i i didn't love the uh interface when i started using it but really it's a it's a good app and um one of the cool things about it what really got me into it i was chair of the task committee at applegate last year which i've done a few times and uh fly sky high puts up a barcode and the barcode lets somebody else read read it and import the entire task in a moment. So on the task committee, we could share with each other draft ideas of tasks. It was hugely facilitating to the task committee process. And then we could just publish the barcode and um, to, a, to a text group. And um, you couldn't, it, at least on an iPhone, you can't read a QR code from inside your phone, but you could hold up the code and I could read it and I could hold up the code and you could read it like that. So it was easy for everybody to input the task who was running Fly Sky High or a number of other apps that support those. So that, <clears throat> that was the impetus that got me to uh, start learning it and really using that as my phone flying app. And, and I actually really like it. So yeah, we will, I expect we'll have time to talk about tasks you know, i feel limited by the battery power on my phone because fly sky high uses <laughs> a lot and that's already when i'm using it so simply so you I probably have it attached to a, a power bank while you fly yep i have uh 20, milliamp hours and uh in my flight deck and a wire that plugs into my phone and it's just part of my pre-flight to make sure that's that the power pack is turned on um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that when okay. everybody's here. Niels, how many people are we expecting? Let's see. I see Lucas, um, maybe Richard. I know John said he, he was interested. Samantha said she was interested. So let's see who we got here. <laughs> Samantha's connecting. So John and Antonio and Ronaldo, uh, Jeff, quite a few. So we can give it another minute. Yeah, we can, we can give a couple more minutes. Or we can even just start to, uh, one of the things I wanted to do is also make a little bit of a, you know, meet and greet and get to know uh, people. So we can also just go around and people can say hi and uh, tell us all a little bit about yourself. So we can do that while we're, uh, while we're still waiting. Shani, why yeah. don't you start? Hi, I'm Shani. Uh, have positioned myself 15 minutes from Allenville so I can hopefully uh, fly more often. Uh, so yeah, hopefully can take advantage of what we learned today. That's where you live right now, 15 minutes from Allenville? In Pine Bush, five minutes from Paco, uh, but right. I still have to come to the city for work. So, yeah, uh, so mm. it's hybrid. Yeah. Like, which actually, I don't. I like the city and I like the outdoors. So, um, trying it out just to see how to make it more sustainable. I think I like it. Mm. Excellent. How about you, Octavian? Hey, I'm Octavian. Um, I'm a P two. I was I was at Brace last 
fall and they they're gonna went flying this 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 uh, spring like a couple of weeks ago too uh, i'm also actually planning on getting a summer house uh, up next to brace to fly more this summer so that'll be cool um and um uh, yeah i i've been flying i mean i used to fly until about 10 years ago also as a p2 and then i stopped for a while and now i'm picking it back up well cool welcome Luca? Hi, I'm not Cecilia. <laughs> <laughs> and a few of you, yeah, you know me. So I'm trying to learn something. <laughs> and what's your name? Antonio. Oh, Antonio, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> Hello, Antonio, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Samantha? Lucas, why don't you go yeah, next? Yeah, I'll go Samantha, real quick because yeah. I'm trying to get this guy and his brother up into the tub and this one wants to hang out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm Sam. Uh, but I guess I know most of you guys. I've seen most of you guys on the hill at some point. Um, except for Shani, I just see her wing far up above mine. Usually as I totally landed like a rock. But um, so yeah, I guess low hour P2, still trying to get time in the Northeast, which is a struggle as a fledgling. Uh, Octavian, if you're serious about trying to find a place to rent, I've actually been looking at Airbnbs and things somewhere between Brace and Ellenville. So definitely message me if you had something you're seriously considering. Because uh, if I fly Brace, it's pretty much like I put the kids to bed, camp overnight to be able to hit um, morning, uh, uh, a morning flight before it gets too thermic. So, um, but yeah, I try to do as much as I can, I guess, out of the air whenever I can. So, uh, which leads me a bit obsessive about the weather and other things. So sorry for all the annoying questions, but appreciate James for you taking the time with us tonight. I don't think questions are annoying usually. So, mm -hmm. um, and you, Lucas, finally. Oh, hi. My name is Lucas. Um, been flying a bit in the northeast. Well, lately with Niels, um, been to Brace two weeks ago. Um, I fly for 10, 11 years, did all my training in Switzerland, and unfortunately I live in Brooklyn, which is nice, but too far away from all the good <laughs> flying spots, so I mostly fly traveling, um, upcoming in 10 days, I'll be in Switzerland again, where I love to fly, but then of course, um, Ellen will race uh, whenever I'm around, um, I'll try to make it up there, looking forward to learning more about all the beautiful apps we have and can use. And thank you so much for putting on the session tonight. All right. And I guess that leaves me. I'm, I'm James. Um, I've been, I've done a lot of paragliding, I guess. I have something like 1200 hours and a lot of international competitions and, um, and I'm delighted to be able to share some of what I've learned with you guys tonight. Um, so I'm going to put a link in the chat. There's no need to open it now, but, but grab it and save it. It's a link to a, a document I started building, which just has some reference links and things in it that you guys can use. We will be going there and using it. So you'll be seeing me do things with it. Um, uh, there's no need to have it open on the side or anything, but try to grab it at some point. Uh, at some point also uh, that page might move into Roland's wiki for New England paragliding. Um, but so there's that. So the, the, the first thing that we're chartered to talk about tonight is airspace and, and how do we think about it? How do we uh, think about it for flying paragliders and how might we keep track of it while we're flying paragliders? And um, it's, it's important to remember that the, the rules around airspace, yeah, they're important and we don't wanna violate them and we don't wanna get in trouble with the FAA. Uh, the FAA kind of leaves us alone as long as they think we're a competently self-regulating body. And if they start to think that we're not taking care of ourselves, they'll be delighted to come and micromanage us and things won't get better if that happens. So um, that's, 
one reason being respectful of airspace is a good idea. Obviously, metal airplanes are also problematic for paragliders. And so far, we haven't had a real collision. We haven't had any collisions between a free-flying paraglider and um, an airplane. It could happen. The, the thing that's really the saving grace for us is it's a big sky out there. And the odds of a near miss are wildly higher than the odds of an actual collision. Um, but if, God forbid, we take out an airliner one day, our sport's going to get a lot different after that. Um, the odds are small of that, but could happen. So um, we want to be thoughtful about airplanes and airports beyond airspace. So here's my teaser question to kick that off. If you're flying over a small airport, like, say, Great Barrington Airport, which you might fly over on an early cross country out of out of Brace. You leave and go north. You get to the Catamount ski area, and just to your right from there is Great Barrington, and there's a little airport there. What's a safe way to go by an airport, a small airport like that? Open eyes. Parallel to the track, I guess, but not over the track. Well, open eyes is good, and um, thinking about the runway and where people are landing and taking off that day, that's good, which direction, so you're not flying right on what would be a final approach path or a, or a climb out path, those things are good. Well, one place that's really good to be is straight over top of the runway, because no one who's using the airport is going to be there. Um, people who are students who are doing touch and goes will be flying in what they call pattern altitude, which is something like a thousand feet. So they'll be doing these sort of ovals where they come down and touch the ground and lift off and make an oval and come back and do it again. And that uses something called pattern altitude. And it's something like a thousand feet. It varies a little bit, I guess. But um, so that means that in addition to the takeoff, um, line and the and the the approach line there's um you you can look for students and things on weekend days doing these ovals on one side or the other um somewhere in the thousand foot range so that's a, a dangerous thing potentially to sort of fly through at a thousand feet if you're if you can't gain any more altitude than that it's probably good to go another way or even to think about landing. But if you're at 3,000 feet or 5,000 feet, you can fly straight over the middle of the airport and just not interfere with any of the activity at the airport because no one who's trying to approach that airport will be there. Um, a little farther north, if your XC continues to go well, you'll find the Pittsfield Airport. Neither of those are, are controlled airspaces at all, but Pittsfield can have quite a bit of traffic um, so you always want to think about how the runways are lined up and, um, and where, which, what the wind direction is and where people might be approaching. Um, and with Pittsfield, people arc around from, from the West and sort of turn onto their final approach late. So I've had it where I was over here and I thought I was offline to the runway and I was. And a business jet flew right underneath me at maybe, I don't know, 200 feet below me. Um, it was just pretty unnerving. Um, and again, uh, that's not even quite a near miss. And so he, it wasn't really a dangerous moment. But it's, it means that as we're looking around, we want to have a wide, want to be looking around a lot. Like Niels was saying, have your eyes open. And um, and be thinking about what the airplanes might be doing. So all of that's um, maybe more important or as important as what we're talking about with airspace. Um, uh, if you're going cross country somewhere, I'm pretty sure Fly Sky High shows the direction of the runways. Uh, we'll look at that a little bit later, but um, failing that, I'm pretty sure Google Earth does. And certainly all the sectionals of uh, the um, airspace documents that pilots use show what all the runways are and what direction they are and things like that. So it's worth 
it's worth learning a little bit about them. And as you get closer to the airport, you can also see them if you're a few thousand feet up and a few thousand feet away, you can see them pretty easily. Okay, so there's, there's one thought. Um, the thing that I really like to do for airspace is, um, is I like to run Google Earth and, um, and look around. So I'm gonna show you how to get uh, airspace into Google Earth. Um, let me, give me a moment here. And James, can I quickly just ask or clarify? So this is Google Earth Pro, or is this like kind of like maps on, like just the maps.google.com? That's a great question. The, um, there is an earth.google.com or something like that, which is a web-based version of Earth, Google Earth um, that they have now. There's also a version for the phone and for the iPad. Those are fun, but as far as I know, there's no way to get an airspace file into those. So you need to download the a downloadable version of the app for whatever computer you have, and then um, and I'll, I'll I'll do that in the next couple of minutes, and you'll see that it, it's quite easy to get airspace in there, and um, and run it. Uh, so let me turn on screen sharing here. And I'm gonna go crazy and just share my whole desktop, which I sort of never do, but I don't see a reason not to here. Um, and my Google Earth seems to have crashed. So give me a second. Okay, so... Um, After you down, download Google Earth and you launch it, is everybody seeing my screen okay? Yeah, is Google Earth Pro? I mean, I have Google Earth downloaded on my phone. That's Pro? Or is that at least Pro paid version? Um, pro is no longer paid. It used to be paid and there was a free one. If you have one that's not called Pro, that's a downloaded version, it's probably old. So it's probably worth going and getting a new one. I put a link on the shared page the page in the chat for where to go and get the latest one. So up at the upper left here, um, let me remember what I signed up for the, okay, up, up, up at the upper left here, um, you can put in a place you'd like to go. And Google Earth will fly you there. So here's Ellenville. And there are a lot of uh, key commands. I've put the ones, I've listed the ones I like the best. I'm not gonna talk too much about them, but I have something which will show you on the screen what I'm pressing. You should see an equal sign right now. Um, but you can't see if I just put two fingers on the trackpad, which is what I'm doing here. Right now I have a, the, the shift key and two fingers on the trackpad, and that's letting me rotate the image like this. And then if I hold the shift key and an arrow, boy, things are really sluggish here for some reason. I can move, but I'm having trouble rotating. Okay, there we go. So that's Ellenville's launch somewhere. No, let's see. That must be Cragsmore. So a little bit farther this way. Cragsmore is up in the back. And here's launch. So we've all seen this from the air. That's where launch is. So um, if I press the minus sign, it backs me out for the direction that I'm looking the plus sign, or really the equal sign, um, pushes me in on the direction that I'm looking. If I use the forward arrow, then I stay at the same elevation, and the backward arrow, I stay at the same elevation. Same with left and right. They let me move by staying, but staying at the same elevation. Um, in the lower right, 
you can see it says I altitude 974 meters. So that's where we're looking from. And to the left, it says elevation. And that's the place that I'm pointing to with my cursor. Or if I don't have my cursor on the, on the image, it's the center of the image. So that's the elevation of the place in the center of the image. Okay, now we'd really like to have a look at airspace here. So I'm gonna switch to my page here. And so at the top of this page, these are airspace tutorials, which I'm gonna to leave to you there. Each one has a little bit different style and you might relate to one better than another. Uh, I think all three of these are pretty good and give you a good idea about what's going on with the different airspaces. The sectional charts are just the flat charts that that airline or airplane pilots use. The sky vector one, I think, is the handiest because you can just load it in any browser. You can load it on your phone, pan around and look at things. So while you're on launch, you can look at the orientation of the runways at Pittsfield, for instance, or even in the air while you're flying. Um, if you have some signal, you could load that. If you want to be able to use sectional charts uh, offline, here's a link for where you can download high res ones. Okay, Google Earth then, there's where you can go and download versions. And down here are where you can download airspace. So this first, this first link is the most interesting to me. Um, I, I'm not very interested in just overlaying a flat sectional file onto 3D Google, Air, Google Earth, because I think the 3D part's interesting. So what we'll do is we'll open this link. So this is the place we go to get the airspace file. Not too surprisingly, we click on get airspace, click on the United States, and we just downloaded the file. So we'll go find the downloaded file. And when I double click on a KMZ file, it automatically will open into Google Earth. Okay, so then we're gonna come back over here and get back to Ellenville. I think I'm going to turn off the mouse pose thing. That's um, it's the free version of that software. It's handy because it, it lets you do this to sort of highlight things, but I don't think I need it very badly right now. It seems to be a little bit in the way. Okay, so we'll go, we'll fly back to Ellenville. And now suddenly, as we look around, we see all these three-dimensional things. And these are- these ominous bubbles. I'm sorry? I just said we see lots of ominous bubbles. Yeah, ominous bubbles. So, and they have, sorry, I'll try to smooth out the navigation here. They have uh, different heights and different shapes. Um, so let's look at, a typical class D airspace. This is Stewart Airport here, this blue one. If I click on it, I'll get a little thing. It's Newburgh class D. And class D is one we need to stay out of. And it's, um, but it just goes from the ground up to 3000 feet. So if, if you're flying along and you're at 8,000 feet, you can cut a corner over it and just pay attention that you have glide to get across and and glide say over this corner and across the river without difficulty um you are allowed to fly over them as long as you manage not to drop in in the middle um so that's a pretty normal class d and you can see it's not super tall it goes from the ground up to three thousand feet and it has this shape um Notice also that it's approximated by a polygon. It's the software isn't trying to draw circles here. I'll talk more about that a little bit later. It basically just means it's true in fly sky high too. So you want to stay a little bit outside. Don't go like one meter away from the edge. 
um, give yourself a little bit of cushion because that's the only way to be sure that you're really outside the airspace and not just outside some software's rendering of it. Okay, so these tall ones here, these red ones, these are skydiving drop zones. This was this is one that you'll run into a lot going cross country from Ellenville. Uh, it's the the Gardner drop zone. And the big thing here is you want to stay out of the center circle because that's really where the meat missiles are flying. Um, and we're not prohibited from flying through drop zone airspace. We're allowed, but you've got to ask yourself if it's a very good idea. Um, this one here is seems to be a new one. Um, I'm pretty sure that wasn't on the chart a couple of years ago or even last summer. Um, not sure where it came from. I'm gonna show you a flight in here also uh, that I did last summer in Ellenville and you'll, you'll be able to see that I, I skirted along staying outside of this main gardener one, but I definitely didn't stay out of that one. I'm pretty sure that one wasn't on the chart last year. So I'm not sure what the story is there and that does can it's trying to stay out of that one would constrain our options for going cross country from Ellenville. You can see where we are here, Minnewaska State Park Preserve. If I back up a little bit, there's Ellenville and launches over here to the right. So if you wanted to fly in a southwest wind from Ellenville, you often fly up this piece of terrain toward Kingston. Kingston's uh, there somewhere. And then maybe cross the river and see if you can make your way on toward Brace. Um, there's another little bit of airspace here. And that's also a drop zone. So I didn't remember that one. Um, this is why we use instruments. They help us keep from for forgetting things. Okay. so. And, uh, James, can I pause you just for a second here? Sure. So with so red is a danger zone, right? That's an advisory. Those and are. So, go ahead. And then it looks like the one over Gardner actually has a, a core drop zone, whereas the one further east doesn't really. Yes. Okay. And I don't know what the story is with that. Um, uh, people flying paragliders from Ellenville fly through this one all the time. Yeah. And, uh, but it's, it's really not a great idea to fly through the center part. One of the things is if you're coming up here, like if, if you're cutting through it a little bit, I don't think that's an issue. Um, you can usually see the skydiving plane. You can usually find it in the air and then you can see where it's going and, and it'll get up to for for beginners they they jump out at 13,000 feet or 135 and this airspace goes up to 14,000 that's why they're so tall um but if you can figure out where the plane's going that day then that gives you a pretty good idea um where you need to stay out of um let's let's look at a couple more things while we're here this one I don't know what the story is with this. This is new. This is Poughkeepsie. And this didn't use to render this way. So I'm not sure why it's suddenly rendering as zero to 18,000 feet. And, and it's class E2. This, this is something new that I'm not aware of. Poughkeepsie used to have class D just like Stuart here. Um, and uh, but as a practical matter, it doesn't affect us very much. We in paragliders, we don't usually fly over airspace. Um, this one, of course, is impossible to fly over at 18,000 feet, but um, uh, we don't usually fly over airspace at all just because there's too much chance of dropping into it. So you could still fly through this crack here. The extension, this little boxy part, that will always be lined up with a runway. So there's some runway that goes this direction. And so that's something to pay attention to. Um, and you can see down there in the middle, there's the runway. 
if we go over to Braze. How are you parsing what these things are, uh, that there's drop zones and that, what is the green one in airport? Like I thought the blue is airports. So you click on it, but the, the labels seem to be code. Well, DZ stands for drop zone. Oh, not danger zone. Okay, drop zone. And um, so all these red ones seem to be that. And, um, and this is the new version of this file, which I just looked at for the first time two days ago, um, getting ready to talk to you guys. The version I've been running for years doesn't show different colors, it just shows all the airspaces. And, and what the story is here with Poughkeepsie, I really don't know. It's, they're calling it class E2. So maybe all these green things are class E2. Um, I'll come back to um, class E extensions from airports in a minute, which these boxes, these are extensions sticking out of the circle. Those are called extensions. Okay, so let's, Head over to Brace if I can find it. Um, not used to being quite this high. <laughs> We're at 12 kilometers up, so let's let's get a little bit lower. Where does it show your altitude again? Far lower right corner. Right now we're at almost four kilometers. So that's still 60, okay. however many feet. Um, James, can you type it in in the top left? Say again? Can you type it in in the top left? Yeah, we can. I think, I think even Brace Mountain is, uh, known quantity here. Okay. So there's the, the launch on Brace. Looks pretty familiar. And if I can get the thing to respond here. So A little bit stuck for a moment while we're loading something new. Um, so if we look east toward Mount Tom, I'm just gonna fly over there. If I can get the thing to respond. So you notice there's, there's one that is a little bit up in the air here. And you've probably heard that airspace can have mushroom shapes and mushrooms we think of as sort of up and then wider up above, and they are, the airspace mushrooms are extremely flat, like this one. So this gives you a, a more, much more accurate picture than any than thinking about mushrooms. Um, no mushroom you've ever seen grows quite like this. So there will be a center area, which goes from the ground up to some altitude. And then there will be a wider area which doesn't start at the ground, but maybe goes from 3,000 to 6,000 feet or something. So let me see if I can back up, get a little more altitude again. So here's an example of that. And so this is Windsor Airport and the town. I think it, this is Hartford. So this center part here is goes from the ground up to 4,200 feet. This is class C. Um, C you can think of as city, B you can think of as big. So class B would be like JFK, class C would be like a city. Um, and most, most class C airspaces have this mushroom. So if we look at this part here, this part, the outer part of the mushroom has the same top, 4,200 feet, but, um, but only starts at 2,100 feet. So 
2,100 feet down to 500 feet or whatever the ground is, isn't a lot of room for thermal flying in a paraglider, it would be unlikely that you would successfully cross all the way underneath one of these wings um, flying on thermals without landing. You'd probably land. But if you were right next to it and you just needed to go under a little bit for a moment, you can do that and there's no penalty. So I encourage you to, to get, uh, get this for Google Earth. Think about where you want to fly. Fly around and familiarize yourself. If you look at the sectional, the sky vector link, you'll see just on a flat view, a flat map view, which is much more responsive, where the different things are. Um, it's worth learning how to read the sectional, what the different colors mean, what the um, what the different labels mean, where you can find the the altitudes, like this stuff, the 2100 to 4200 stuff. It's all there on the sectional. Um, and this is usually more responsive than it seems to be when I'm combining it with Zoom. Um, it's easier to move around. And over here on the left, things that you've opened up, uh, when you close Google Earth, you'll have a chance to save what you've opened. These are um, Google calls them temporary places. You can save them and then they'll be over here all the time. And you can always come in here and turn them off if you want to use Google Earth without it. And you can also turn off, okay, I don't want to see the danger. I don't want to see all the drop zones. You can just turn those off and just look at um, uh, airplane airspace um, for, a, for a little bit simpler view. Any questions about this stuff? James, do you mind showing us uh, Great Barrington quickly? Just because that's sort of probably the closest airspace you might encounter, or excuse yeah. me, the closest air, airport you'd encounter from launching from Grace. There's Can no- you how that shows up. Yeah, okay. So let, let's, I'm gonna turn all this stuff off because this is not, there's no airspace around Great Barrington. So okay. this will hopefully make the make the thing a little bit more responsive. So, okay, so here's Brace Mountain and we'll get a little bit lower. So we're sort of like flying altitude. So one and a half kilometers. So we're something like five or 6,000 feet. So this is an altitude where you might actually leave Brace to go cross country. And uh, maybe you've already done that. So we turn and we're looking north. Um, and as we start to go, of course, we're trying to find more thermals. This bare spot here is always turbulent. Um, just expect it to be rough there or go some other way. Um, and as you keep going, uh, when the wind's from the west, I'd like to avoid landing down in here. So if I get low, along the main ridge, I'm likely to come out in front and look for something on these. And there are a lot of fields here to land if you're not making it. Um, the thing to do when you're starting cross country, I don't know how much experience all you guys have, but uh, just commit and go. And maybe you'll land after 3K and we all do that sometimes. And, um, just try to have fun and don't worry about exactly how far you get. And after a few tries, you'll find you're stringing together several thermals and going um, 10 or 20 kilometers and it starts to be really fun. Um, so as we keep coming up here, we're coming up on the Catamount ski area. There's usually a climb right here, right on top of Catamount ski area or just on the back side of it. So you can see ski runs now. Is everybody seeing this okay? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's that's the Catamount ski area. Somewhere around here, there's almost always a climb. Um, so it, it's a good place to fly straight over. And then if we turn right a little bit, now I have to find it because I haven't gone this way in a while. But right over here somewhere is the Great Barrington Airport. There it is. Everybody see the runway? 
right here. Oh, geez. You, you want to get used to recognizing them in the air and finding them quickly. Mm. Um, so if I get to here, now I'm lined up with where someone might be on final approach or mm. more likely taking off because I usually fly brace in a westerly wind. So um, they'd be taking off into wind. So if I'm if I am coming by here, and it, it's okay to come by, it's a small airport, and you're fairly far out. Um, but and but on this side of it, I'd be looking toward the airport because I'm looking for planes coming from the airport. On the other side of it, I'd be looking away from the airport because I'd be looking for planes coming in. If the wind is westerly people will be going from east to west, both for landing and for taking off. But a really safe place to be, like I was saying, is right, right over it. At five or 6,000 feet, because now you're out of all the path <clears throat> and nobody's, nobody who's dealing with that airport is going to be there. Did that answer your question, Niels? <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. And um, maybe, guys, I know this all sounds a little bit technical and theoretical, but it's just a good tool to start even just on launch talking to people. You know, in its simplest form, you can even see that, let's say, going east from Ellenville over the back, it does get crowded. And so then you can talk to people about, okay, so I don't really have to worry about Poughkeepsie until I cross the Hudson. So that's quite a ways away, but Stewart to the Southeast is closer. And then those drop zones as we dance along the Ridge could be something that, you know, we encounter quite a bit. And so that all, I think in a pilot community translates into sort of flying tips and discussions, but this is sort of the basis of it. Okay, so let's let's look at a flight that I did last summer. Um, if you're if you'd like to store flights on Leonardo, uh, you have to make a paragliding forum account, which is easy, and then you can once you're logged in, you can come here and you can go straight to submit flight and just take a file from um, Fly Sky High or another instrument. And you can even set fly high, fly sky high. You can put in your Leonardo credentials, your login and password, and fly sky high will automatically submit every flight that you make. And you can delete any ones later that where you only flew 3K and you don't want people to see it or whatever. But um, that makes it really easy to, to have a record of your flight in Leonardo. So if I just click on Leonardo, it'll take me there one of these days, the entire paragliding forum runs off one server in a room somewhere. So it's not very responsive. Okay, and I'm just gonna to come to the main menu and say my flights, this will show in reverse chronological order, all the flights I've recorded here. And so from last summer at Ellenville, so, when you look over to the right, if I click on the magnifying glass, that's gonna show me the top view of the flight um, with the barograph and so on. And that's a nice look at it. But if I wanna see it in Google Earth, this next one, which looks like the Google Earth icon, that's what I wanna click on. I click on that and I can pick which, how detailed the Google Earth file I want. I'm just gonna grab the biggest one here because when they were calling these small and medium and big, our notion of what a big file is has multiplied since then. And I don't think this has been updated. So I'm just gonna grab the biggest one. This is gonna download a can another KMZ file, which is a flight track. So I'm just gonna go and open that. And that will open into Google Earth directly. And here it is. So this is a flight at Ellenville. I think I got the Ellenville flight. Um, so let's see here. I'll turn the airspace back on in a minute. 
So one of the fun things about this for, for looking at a flight is you can um, move around and, and in, in 3D, what you did kind of comes to life when you move around it. And it stops looking like just a flat image. And so that's pretty cool. And this is just in Google Earth. I have the airspace turned off at the moment, but this just lets us see my flight. So I had one good climb here and then Davidson was leading over the back. So we went there. So well, let's, let's take a look at this without, um, without the airspace on for the moment. So things are more responsive. And then here we're, we were looking for climbs here on the high ground. And there's often a climb somewhere around this mesa here and just couldn't find it. Um, nobody found it. And uh, so we started heading out and it was a little worrisome. Um, Daniel, um, who flies a white leopard, was underneath me. And I was a little bit worried about him, but um, just in terms of whether we had glide to a, to a suitable field, because we, we really let ourselves get a little bit lower than was really prudent. And um, happily, we ran into a climb. Daniel got it too underneath me. And then we were able to climb back out and everybody else got another one somewhere over here. So the, the flight carried on. The various other people um, dropped off at some point. But um, and here I'm sort of skirting that airspace. So let's just turn on the airspace for a moment. So you can see I'm skirting this right-hand one, the larger gardener one that we were talking about. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with the controls. And then this one I'm sure wasn't there. So I was being attentive not to fly into the right-hand one. Um, and then I got up here, I'm gonna turn the airspace off just so I can give you a quick review of this flight because it was kind of fun and a little bit of, of decision-making. I was I had been thinking about trying to fly to Brace and um, I flew right over the Mohawk Mountain House, which was pretty fun. And, um, and I started heading off that way, but farther to the east, the sky was dry. There were no clouds. There were clouds over here. And it just looked like, okay, I can glide over the river, but what's going to happen then? It's not clear to me that, I, like, there's the Poughkeepsie Bridge down there and the Kingston Bridge up there. I'm going to be in between the bridges. I'm going to have a $150 Uber ride to get back. And for what? <laughs> I just couldn't see that I was going to make it any farther. So I just turned around thinking, Okay, maybe I can get back over to the far, to the Ellenville Valley. From there, somebody might be willing to come and pick me up. So I just start carrying on, and and I keep finding climbs, and so I start now. I'm somewhere along in here, I'm thinking, gee, maybe I can make it back. So you can see from how the climbs are tilted, which way the wind is blowing at that point, because. Um, I'm blowing with the wind, of course, as I'm climbing, and the wind has kind of changed. It's like right here, this is kind of a, a, a southeast wind or more, more southerly. So I'm flying into wind. The reason I come out here to the right is one of the nice things that Fly Sky High does is it shows you where you need to put the next corner of your triangle if you want to make a flat triangle flight. And so I could see by looking at fly sky high, which is what I was running, I could see that I needed to stick a corner way out here somewhere if I wanted to qualify as an FAI triangle. So I managed to get out there and this little climb, you can see I wasn't making really any forward progress. I kind of came gliding back along the same path I'd been climbing on. It was just too slow for how windy it was. And then I found a better one, and that, that gained me a little bit of altitude. And at all times, I had a place to land. 
I was attentive to where the prison was. You, you want to learn where the prison is. This is it here. You don't want to land inside the prison. Um, they won't arrest you, but you, you, you won't have a fun day if you land in the prison. Um, I haven't done it, but people have, <laughs> crazily enough. So you also don't want to overfly the prison low because they think you're dropping something for somebody. And so I was attentive to staying over over the terrain here and not over the prison. Once I got on the other side, then I flew back out to the valley and I thought I might land at the airport because <clears throat> the climbs were slow. As you can see, I'm barely climbing at all through some of these, but managed to put together, managed to put together enough height and then a little bit of a lifty line and made it back to launch and close the triangle. Um, so, that's cross country decision making. You have an idea for what you want to do. You have a flight plan, but you might change it for some reason. As long as you keep places to land in mind, there's no reason you have to do exactly what you thought you were going to do. Any questions about that? Uh, James, you mentioned, oh, go ahead, Sean. Sorry. You go first. James, you mentioned fly sky high. So do you see airspace in fly sky high? Yeah, that's a great question. Let's, let's turn it on here. I can show you. Um, bear with me here, fly sky high. Um, so fly sky high is one of the easiest ways to see airspace. Um, I'm gonna stop this share. Um, lots of, lots of instruments will show you airspace, um, and lots of them require you to find an airspace file and download it and connect your instrument to your computer and, and upload the file to the device and so on for, or the segment that's about the region you're going to fly in. It's kind of a huge headache. Um, fly sky high, you just have to purchase the airspace option and turn on the airspaces that you want to see. And I'll show you how to do that. Let's see if I can get. The phone to share here. Okay. Um, is everybody seeing that? Yes, do the colors mean the same thing as, so everything red is drop zones and blue is airports? Or no, is um, um, that's not a universal convention, although it is true that the, that the things in red here are drop zones, but the things around New York, that's class B airspace and not drop zones at all. That's FK and Newark and LaGuardia. So, I'm not sure exactly what the conventions are, but you can tap on a, well, <laughs> as I was telling the latecomers earlier, um, Fly Sky High is constantly trying to return you to where you are. So it's gonna keep doing that to us here. We'll just ignore it. So if I tap on one of these, maybe I have to tap and hold. Okay, I tap and hold, that's the gardener, um, uh, drop zone, zero to 1400 feet. No, sorry, that's some other drop zone. This is, this is the Gardner drop zone. Um, this is that new one. And that's the one just north. Of, I don't know how to show you my finger on the phone here, but if I tap on the Newburgh airspace, okay, hold on a sec. Let's take a little different tack. We'll just go to the basic map, which is easier to navigate. On. Okay, I'm going to tap on Newburgh again. So Newburgh is class D, just goes from the ground to 3,000 feet. So, but as you're looking from Ellenville and all the little things that look like music notes, those are just waypoints I have in here to make tasks out of, um, to improvise tasks out of. Um, and I have those as a file that you can grab and um, import easily if you want to. Um, 
So Ellenville launches there. Uh, that's the, sorry, that's the landing zone. That's launched there, Ellenville takeoff. So we want to stay out of circles no matter the color. Well, it's, it's, it's a, it, that's a good conservative idea. Um, uh, if I were flying that flight we just looked at today, I probably wouldn't worry about that, that um, line that went through the, uh, this, the second circle north of Gardner. The reason is that there's that whole ridge of high terrain there. No one's going to drop skydivers on top of that ridge. They're just not going to do that. They're going to be out in the valley. So that line that I took that was um, along the ridge would still be quite safe. I wouldn't be worried about that at all. And where I turned to the east to contemplate going toward Brace, that was really above that circle, sort of halfway between Kingston and Poughkeepsie. Um, so you can think in, in terms like that. No one's going to, where, where's someone actually going to drop the skydivers? It's not going to be on top of a forested ridge. Um, no skydiver wants to land there. How do you see the heights while you're fl flying? The heights of the airspace? No. And as far as I know, you can't. Um, but if you press and hold, it will tell you what it is. So you cut a finger off of your glove so you can maneuver the map as you fly? Yeah, it's, um, it's a good question. Um, uh, you can cut a finger off. You can have a stylus on a string. You can have gloves that are that have... Mark. Yeah. You know, capacitive sensitivity. Um, the ones that have capacitive sensitivity are quite variable in how well they work. Yes. And I haven't had any that I thought worked really well, but they work well enough often. Very often, I'll, I'll just kind of put my hands together and I'll pull out my thumb and I'll use my thumb to do something on the instrument. Um, and mostly, mostly the... the the airspace that I commonly run into, I, I know what the heights on those are. I know what they are. And what I need Fly Sky High to do is to show me as I'm flying along um, with some advance notice, okay, what do I need my track to be to make sure I stay out of it? And so, um, and doing some flying around in Google Earth is, I found it really instructive. I like to think about cross country lines. And I don't just look at airspace, I look at where are their landing fields? Because like all of Western Massachusetts is trees. It's hard to pick lines through Western Massachusetts. There are there are some, but um, sometimes I've mapped them out with a, with twenty waypoints just to try to find a way where I could keep going. Because when you're low over a field and there's some wind blowing, you get a weak thermal. You can't leave a field with a weak thermal to drift you over 10 miles of trees. It's just not, you know, you, there's just too much risk for being in a tree if you lose the thermal or if it peters out early. Um, and if it's if it's weak, you might not have glide to get back to the field you just left flying into wind. If you have a strong climb, then great, because you've easily got glide back to that field and you can see, do I get high enough to reach the next one? Can I make the next lily pad? So, um, that's something I, I look at a lot in Google Earth. And, and I like to take tracks from other people, like Donny Zetti had a flight from Petersburg Pass where he flew to his house. What line did he take? And, and you can learn a lot about how somebody's thinking by, by watching their track. And um, one of the things you can do is um, in Google Earth, which I neglected to show you earlier, but you can rotate around a thermal. So here's the circling coming up to where you're looking down the thermal. Those circles will usually line up pretty much on one point. They'll aim at one point on the ground. That's where that thermal triggered. And thermals trigger in the same place a lot. And so on another day, if you're going through that same place, you, you're 
have decent odds of finding a thermal there again. And very often, like in the Donizetti flight I looked at not too long ago, um, he'd be flying toward a larger ridge, hoping for a thermal on the larger ridge, and he'd find a climb on the way there. And when you look at where it was, it was from a small hill in the valley. And um, so sighting down the, the cores of thermals can be can be interesting for for seeing where thermals trigger in that area. What convention do you like to follow in waypoint setting? Are those LZs fields? Are they thermals? The sorry, which all the flag or what you called notes, your waypoints, are they demarking places you consider landing and can it be you their waypoints? of interest because you could land there or are they where you expect to find thermals how do you like neither to neither they're they're just waypoints that i've thought could be interesting to try to make a task or a triangle task or something like that um and un unlike a competition if you're just trying to fly a triangle across country you can cut the point off if you're not going to get there because it's too much into wind or there isn't a thermal and just do something a little different. Um, Fly Sky High isn't the friendliest for dropping points out of the out of a task, or maybe I just don't know how to do it. Um, but but th these aren't intended to, to mark landing zones. Um, they're just waypoints and the reason there are so many is i used to often try to fly triangles around brace and so this just gave me a lot of options for picking picking points to use and in fact it's almost easier to just improvise something on launch based on the day fly sky highlights you put in pins here and there and here and there, and then just try to go there and that becomes your task. So let's look at tasks for a moment. We go into settings. So at the top, all these extensions, these, these are things you have to pay for. Nothing's very expensive. They're you know $5 a year or $10 a year. Um, to have air spaces, you have to have paid for and installed the, the airspace extension. So. You definitely want that. Um, the XC package lets you add files with thermals. It lets you have the, um, the sort of thermal tracker that helps you keep track of where the stronger lift has been while you're turning. Um, you can see a bar graph if you want. You can put a bar graph on one of your pages. Um, so that package is very worthwhile. Um, I like to support the, the guy who develops this and it's not very expensive, so I just buy everything. Um, then when you come in to settings, which is the lower part of this, you come into airspaces. So here, here you can say airspace sources, official or other. If you're flying in Switzerland, you can get an airspace file from somewhere which covers like the parts of mountainsides where protected species live and you're not supposed to fly over them. And fly sky high by saying both on this page, you can have normal airspace and also custom files like that. Um, and fly sky high will show you where they are. And in a small number of places in the world, you'll, you'll run into those kinds of constraints. Um, and uh, airspace classes, you can turn on and off what you want to see. Class A is 18,000 feet everywhere. Out west, we can fly higher than that, um, but not legally. Out east, we never get to 18,000 feet. So you can leave class A turned off so you're not wasting calculation power on that. And then most of these you can leave turned off. Um, B through D are the most important. Um, class E and the extensions that we were talking about earlier, um, like the one on Poughkeepsie. So there's this lighter green 
this this is better than the rendering that we saw in in Google Earth. This lighter green that you see around Poughkeepsie is a Class D extension, and I'm not sure what exactly they're trying to control with that, but um, Yushba was at some pain to get clarification from the FAA, and we are allowed to fly through those. So you have to stay out of the circle at Poughkeepsie, but you can fly through the green part with the usual caveat that you want to pay attention to where the airplane might be that day. Um, but we are legally allowed to fly through there. Coming back to settings. Um, get out of airspace. So in pilot and glider, sorry, that's not the right one, maps. So in maps, right now I have orientation set to north. And that makes it easy when I'm trying to show something or when I'm trying to plan something on launch because the map's not rota rotating as I turn. But when you're flying, I would set it to flight direction or possibly compass heading, but I think fl flight direction so you can see which way you're actually making good in a crosswind. Um, I would fly with it there. And um, map scales, the way Fly Sky High does zooming is you tap once and it goes to the next zoom level. And if you have wrapped around turned on, it goes all the zooms way out and then goes way all the way in. You can choose how many of the steps you want. Um, on the document that's in the chat, I've I've put links to some Google, some um, sorry, some Fly Sky High tutorials. Uh, a British guy named Tim Tim Pentreath, who's a, a big Fly Sky High enthusiast, has made some tutorials on YouTube that really give you a, an excellent briefing of this program, and um, which I'm not trying to do here. And I do recommend those if you're thinking to start flying with them. Did you increase the map storage space? Mine is way smaller than what you had there. Probably I did. Yeah, just because my phone has a lot of storage and I, I don't want to run out or be getting messages while I'm flying. It doesn't mean it has to be this big. What do I have? I have, that's... 600,000? 600,000 megabytes? No, that can't be quite right. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, you have 600 gigs, uh, James. Right. But it's yeah. default is one gig. So. <laughs> right. You, you have a big iPhone. So uh, yeah. The, I, that's so map you don't have to load while you're flying? Or what is, my, what is the purpose? My, my phone's not that big. Um, um, yes, maps will load. Um, if you're if you go to a new place to fly, open Fly Sky High in the hotel, especially while you're on Wi-Fi, and just let it load all the stuff around. Um, and uh, I'm sure Tim's tutorials will address that in more detail. I, I have never had it not load what I needed if I remember to do that. If you have a good cell connection and your, your data plan allows you to use some data, you can also do it on launch. Um, but not all launches have good cell, cell coverage. That's really funny. I had it set to 6 billion terabytes. Any questions? I have it open. I don't see that. Oh, I don't see that green space. So that would be E2 that I need to enable. Yeah. And then uh, I answered my own question. Do you like to uh, fly with the Google, like Google Earth satellite view or this view that you're showing? I like this view. I, I like to see the terrain. Um, and the, the satellite view is a lot more downloading. and. Uh, so if you're flying and you've got weak cell connection or any limitations in your data plan, you're, you're at risk of running out. Plus, it doesn't really show me what I want to see. The terrain is mostly what I want to see. And if there are trees coming, I can see those. And the landing fields, I can see those. So it's different than when I'm flying around in Google Earth musing about some idea for a cross-country flight. And Google Earth, I like to have the trees turned on. Of course, it shows me everything like we were looking for, looking at earlier. 
Um, but in and, and James, just to quickly clarify, when you say flying around the Google Earth, right? You're you're like at home on your computer. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, so what was what Shani was just talking about is in here, map style. I could turn on Arial, and now when I come back to the map, now it looks like uh, Google Maps aerial or satellite view, and instantly. People talk about that as a satellite view. Most of it is aerial survey. It's from planes flying overhead. It's not actually photographed from satellites, but it doesn't matter. It's from way up in the air. So yes, you can fly with it like this, but to me, like I can't see much looking at that. It doesn't tell me where to look for the next thermal. Whereas if I have it in the other mode, which is just terrain, now I can see where the where there are hills and bumps and things that that might be of some use to me. Does that make sense? Yes, I have more questions, but I've been asking, so others feel free. Probably no. questions you go ahead. Go thinking. ahead, Shani. Yeah. yeah. So earlier uh, you showed us your flight, uh, your that uh, great flight. You said you were you thought you had to land at the airport. Were you going to actually land at were you following the advice of trying to catch a thermal above the airport or were you going to land there because airports are nice to land in and that one is decommissioned or something inactive? That's a great question. Um yeah, after what I said earlier, what was I doing going to land at an airport? Um an airport like Ellenville, which is uh, low traffic um, is actually okay to land at as long as you're not coming in on something that where, where a plane's going to be on final approach or taking off. So in this case, um, if I got low in here, I could come across the runway at a couple hundred feet because just watching for someone who might be doing a low pass, that would be unusual. Or I could come across a little bit higher and lose altitude over here, watching for planes who might be doing touch and goes in the pattern altitude, and then just land on the, on the tarmac, some open place here or on, on a little piece of grass by the taxiway. In fact, in fact, when I've landed here, it's been on a piece of grass. Um, the reason it works here is Ellenville's really light traffic. There just aren't a lot of planes there. So, and they're generally very small. There aren't any business jets, at least that I've ever seen going out of, in and out of Ellenville. And it's not, it's not a very long runway. So you can't be a very big plane and land there. So all of these things mean, as long as you're paying attention, it's okay to land at a little tiny airport. Um, I wouldn't try to land at Pittsfield at the airport. I'd land somewhere nearby. Um, and here you you could land somewhere else. The place I've landed a few times is this high school here, which is kind of straight off the runway. So um, you want to watch for what, again, what the airplanes might be doing that day. But um, and if you're landing at a high school <laughs> or a, a place with baseball fields, be aware there can be a lot of fences and you really need to figure those out so you're not coming in on final and you realize you've committed to flying through a fence, right. turning down wind and piling oh, yes. in or something. So try to, try to look carefully for fences anytime you see baseball fields or tracks or things like this. They they aren't all showing up very well on this on this uh, aerial view, but there are, are a number of fences in this one, if I recall, and there usually are. What else, Shani? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so what sparked this conversation was I flew uh, around Orange County Airport. So that's not a official airspace. So looking around and then deciding to fly away was uh, I survived clearly but any other thoughts that you would have about that particular one what is that one called again 
Orange County Airport. And is that, is that New York? Uh, yes. Gentle. Is that Montgomery? Uh, don't, I'm gonna, let me see. Montgomery, New York. Okay, I think I think this is it. Yes, it, it was Montgomery. Yes. So this is this is southwest of Ellenville. Is that right? Over the back, uh, south. So southeast. I'm going to turn the airspace back on so I can figure out where we are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You can eat if you want. Oops, that's not the right thing. Okay, so you're outside of Stewart airspace, which is there. So this is another little tiny one. I've never flown close to this one, I don't think. Or if I have, I was coming by through here and didn't really notice it. I've never landed around there. What What would you say about it? There are lots of fields, uh, but uh, and there was a the highway. But yeah, it was easy to get an Uber. I don't know. I yeah, there were planes uh, around. One was at my altitude, and I was like, oh, I need to think about what I'm what I'm doing here. That I, I don't know. I mean, not a ton of planes. It looked like hobbyists, not big planes. Okay. Well, same things apply. Um, based on the wind direction, people will probably be using one or the other of these airports, of these um, runways. And so which one is that? You should be able to guess about that and maybe verify by watching what the planes are doing. And um, and then when you're when you're approaching, don't don't fly off the ends of the runway in either direction, come in from some other angle. Um, and maybe land over here or something like that or here or even across the street but but not over here because this would be off the end of the runway so that's what i think about um because that's it's, it's all about where where the metal planes are going to be going there's another thing that's worth remembering which is the little planes the hobbyists like you say the cessnas and the the uh, the small planes, those guys are looking out the window and they're looking out the window a lot, even most of the time. And they're trying to look for other things in the air, including paragliders. So you notice I buy red paragliders a lot. And if there isn't a red one, then I'll try to get orange or something like that. And I want to be visible to those guys, but um, the business jets and on up aren't looking out the window. There and the big, the really the 737s aren't looking out the window. And those people stop looking out the window about 50 feet off the ground on takeoff. And they start looking out the window a few hundred feet above the ground on final approach. And in between, they're watching their instruments. And their instrument panel shows them other traffic, but it's not from them having radar. They don't have radar. What they have is a connection to the ground. The ground has radar and it picks up things that have transponders, which is airplanes that say what their altitude is and what kind of plane they are and stuff like that. And then that whole set of information, all the planes in the area gets sent out to the planes in the air. So it sort of looks like they have their own radar, but that's not what's happening, which means they don't see us on, on their screens. Someday, um, transponders will get to be so small and light um, and hopefully not $5 million and we'll be able to fly with them in our harnesses. And I'm looking forward to that day. It would be great for us to be mapped on those screens with everybody else, but right now we aren't. So don't expect the business jets to see you out the window. Um, if you see one, you know, five miles away that seems to be coming straight at you. You can do a spiral dive pretty quickly to get out of the way. There's not too much you can do. And they five, they cover five miles so quickly, a paraglider is just not gonna fly very far in that time. 
but probably you'll get lucky because that's what's very likely to happen and they'll go by hey um, <laughs> james can you talk a little bit about power like battery and power management and bluetooth integration Pros, yeah, that's, pros. that's a great question. Um, so the thing that Fly Sky High is missing as a standalone app is uh, a sensitive enough Vario. And um, that's not Fly Sky High's fault. The, even the new phones, even the, the latest generation of phones, which are so amazing in so many other ways, don't have variometers that are sensitive enough for what we do. Um, the accelerometers are quite good and you could imaginably, I don't know, it might be possible with some combination of the accelerometer and the variometer to make a better vario that only worked in the phone. But um, for the moment, having the phone as your only instrument doesn't work really well for that reason. Um, well there, there are two ways to address that. One is to have a second instrument. And I usually fly with another one that I like the sound of, and I have that be my audio. So that's my variometer. I keep the sound turned down on Fly Sky High. And another option is, uh, and one I, I, I put a link to in, on the page, is the XC Tracer Mini, which doesn't have a screen at all. Oh, if you want my sandwich, sure you can have it. Oh, no, it's right. Okay. Uh, uh, what, the one that's uh, on the uh, counter? Yeah, it should be half there. It's uh, chicken. Uh, I don't know. I'd be able to mute him. Brad, you, you've, you've unmuted yourself. Oh. Okay. Um, um, so with something like the XE Tracer Mini, you can make a Bluetooth connection to Fly Sky High, and Fly Sky High will get the Vario information from XE Tracer. And at that point, Fly Sky High is the only instrument that you need. Um, in terms of, and there are some other things which will let you, which will let you do that uh, Bluetooth connection. Um, what is XC Tracer? It's a it's a small instrument. It doesn't have a screen. It has a very sensitive Vario, mm -hmm. and it does record a track log. So if for some reason you needed a track log and and you had to restart Fly Sky High during the flight. You didn't have a complete track log. XE Tracer will have one for you. In terms of power, um, I fly with a thing about this big. That's twenty thousand milliamp hours. And the thing that you, that's important in choosing a a battery is you want one that's sensitive to the power that's being drawn, so that it won't shut off. Some some of the battery packs will shut off. And then halfway through the flight, you'll notice that your phone's low on battery and now you're trying to figure out how to press the button to turn the battery pack back on. If you're, the ones that work better, if, um, and I don't think the one I have is sold anymore, but um, uh, if, if I get to 100% charge, but my phone isn't going to sleep because I'm running fly sky high, the battery pack won't shut off. And so that's really helpful. Generally, unless I've made some mistake with something, um, I just have to turn it on, turn the battery pack on once after I plug it into the phone. And then I put it in the pocket of my flight deck, zip it up with just the wire coming out. Um, in terms of in terms of case, this is what I walk around town with my phone in most of the time. And I have another one like this. It doesn't have to have the the MagSafe ring. Any twenty dollar case is fine. And um, I put Velcro on that. And uh, if it doesn't have a hole, I drill a little hole and loop a loop a small paragliding line through it. So I have a tether for a safety line. And I just put the, I just plug the phone into that case. That case stays on my harness and makes it really easy to fly with the phone. And when I land, I just pop it out of that case and put it back in this one. Um, with 20,000 milliamp hours, I have enough charge that 
uh, after a five hour flight, I land and my phone is fully charged when I land and the battery pack is maybe three fourths depleted. And that's five hours of flying with fly sky high running the whole time and cellular connection running the whole time. So the, the newer phones um, have more battery in the phone and the processors use more power and of course are able to do more things, but it does mean you need a bigger power bank to plug into if you wanna be able to land. I would aim for 10,000 milliamp hours and more is okay, 10,000 is really enough. My goal is if after five hours I land in a tree, I wanna be able to talk to rescuers for the next 48 hours, not necessarily with my phone on all the time, but without totally running out of battery. So that's sort of my background goal on how much power I've so far not needed to do that. And I hope I don't, but if I ever do, it'd be nice not to run out of battery. <laughs> Anyone else That's have a question? Thank you. Just a footnote, by the way, that iPhones might get satellite, emergency satellite communications next year, I think. It's sort of that's something they're looking into. Wow. Which would sort of make the in reach wow. reduction. Like a Vidium satellite? Hmm. Sorry, Niels, that garbled out a little bit. Can you say that again? So there's reliable rumors that I, the iPhone in 2023 will have an emergency satellite option to text. So basically it would give it the, the capabilities that we need to use an in reach or similar for right now. Oh, fascinating. But another reason to, to keep your iPhone charged yeah um and if you have an inreach it is possible to send a text via satellite to any phone when you don't have any cell service at all and um i've only used that i don't know three times um when i've landed somewhere where i had no service and somebody was looking for me that sort of thing um it's incredibly helpful when you need it um i mean it you can keep pressing the button and sending landed okay messages as you keep walking down the dirt road or whatever it is that you're doing. But it's, it's really helpful to you to know, are they 10 minutes away or an hour away or, you know, just, and can they see the road to you or do you need to walk some different direction to get to where they can pick you up? All those kinds of things you can sort out nicely if you have, uh, some two-way communication. Otherwise, you're just guessing and you might be out there a couple extra hours. So that is really handy. I hadn't heard that about, about the iPhones. That's pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah, hey, James, I had a question. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Your, your thermal assistant tool that you have on Fly Sky High, do you use it or do you use something else to help assist you um, in centering and coring thermals? Um, these days I use it, but I don't use it much for centering. Um, uh, there, there are a lot of approaches to centering. And uh, the, the thing I mostly do is um, I, I, I do do different things. But the thing I mostly do is I notice which part of the circle I'm getting the weakest climb in. And then from there, I 90 degrees later, I extend a little bit. So mm. what that does is it shifts my circle a little bit toward the stronger part of the climb. And um, very often in many thermals, I'm making that, that adjustment every single circle. Um, mm. Occasionally in some parts of the world, you might be in a big fat thermal that's just smooth and it's just beeping evenly all the way around. And, you can hook your thumb on the carabiner and go to sleep. And yeah. that's, in my experience, that's very unusual. Um, and if you're, if you're trying to climb effectively, uh, you want to be making adjustments all the time. It's the, one of the keys is to make small adjustments 
because it's really easy to get too far. And then just as, and in New England, a lot of the thermals are not very big. And then it can be hard yeah. to, to find where it was. And that's when I'll look at the thermal assistant is, okay, which way did I lose it? If, if, if I don't know, hopefully sometimes I have an idea, but sometimes I just lost it. And that can help me find my way back to it. Um, but I don't try to use it actually for centering. I, I do that mostly this other way. Okay. Yeah, I'm a little confused on the color scheme that they use on, on the display in Fly Sky High. Do you understand? Um, and obviously the red is gonna be you know, stronger lift outside of the green or the yellow. Um, can you tell me how it is that you, that you use that tool as an assistant though for thermaling? Like what is it that you use on that centering tool that's constantly changing as you're in the thermal? Um, I use it if I'm exploring, like say, say there's a weak climb and I just have a feeling that there should be a stronger one around. And so very often I'm downwind of where the better part of the climb is and say there's a cloud overhead. So I'll fly, I'll fly upwind and explore a little bit. And if I fall out of it and I hit a lot of sink and I want to get back to where I was. Um, I'll look at the assistant just to see where were the last colored dots and what pattern looks like it would be useful to, to get back there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I, I, I sky high unit, um, as well as the Flymaster. I'm not sure what model I have GPS SD. I think it is, but, um, I gotta, I gotta say that the, Flymaster thermal tool seems very accurate. I, I keep going back to use and looking at it, even though it's just a little dot on the screen, right? That uh -huh. open the thermal. I, I do have an old Flymaster live and, and um, I haven't been using it for a while, but um, I do think that, that Flymaster is pretty good for that. But I think it's, I, um, I think if you if you try to do your centering with that, you might miss developing more sensitivity that you'd like to have. And mm. so I would encourage you not to look at it for centering unless you feel like you've lost the climb and then then look to try to get back to it. But um, um, hey, I'm up in the air and I'm feeling, um, you know, <laughs> winglistics, right? That's a course I think that uh, Ken Hudgenson Jorgensen, I think, teaches, but um, maybe I should take it, but I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out all the different um, uh, hits that I get on, on my glider as I'm flying and not sure, okay, is that telling me to go closer? You know, should I, or should I back away? Am I, am I falling out? Am I on the edge? You know, it's, it's so hard to read many times. Yeah, that's, um, that's a great one. And one of the things that I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about is um, when you're low, the thermals can be very fragmented and very small, very narrow. And so you might fly into some lift and start to turn and just fall out of it and think, fuck, I just lost it. But in fact, it might be so narrow that you can't possibly fly a circle in the thermal and you're going to end up climbing in a little part of your circle until you get a bit higher and the thermal gets a little more organized. So um, if you're low and you seem to be falling out of it, there might be nothing anybody could do better than that. Um, just allow that to happen and try to use what you can out of it. And then in terms of when, when the glider's uh, talking to you, um, what, what Ken likes to talk about is the, the difference between flying along and suddenly this side gets yarded up mm -hmm. that means the thermal is probably right here mm -hmm. and flying and then the glider does this and that means the thermal is probably over there because what's happening is you're getting sucked this way toward an inflow and so that's more likely to happen when you're lower where air is flowing into the thermal from different sides so it it has a little similar feeling because it's tilting the same direction in both cases. And what you're trying to find is the sensitivity to separate, okay, it's pulling up versus, okay, it's just kind of slumping a little bit. And 
I think with practice, you can distinguish those. Okay, thanks. One, one other thing, um, if you start, start to turn it, if you aren't sure which way to turn, like you haven't had a clear indication like that. Um, so I start to turn one way. Mm -hmm. um, if the, if the variable is not increasing, very often I'll just turn about 40 degrees and then I'll turn back the other way and I'll take my circle around the other direction because very often if I keep on, I'll fall out of it. I might fall out of it if I turn back also, but it might mean that I'm really on this edge of it. And if I turn back, it's, I'm pretty sure that I, I, uh, I do better that way. Um, if I start to turn and the variable is increasing, then I stay there. Okay. Um, but, it, but if I start to turn and right away I fall out of it, that's another good time to turn back because probably I just came by, came through the edge of it. And if I turn back the other way, I'll get back to it. Wait, would you go 180 or you would just continue the same direction? Um, not 180, but so I'm starting this way and now I, now I hit sync. That suggests the thermals may be over here. I turn back this way. So I'm not making a 180, but I'm just changing my circle to be the other direction. Did that make sense? Yes, yes, that was my question. Uh, and what does it feel like when you feel it on one side? Does the wind tip into it or does the wind like lift up and this being the, like the side in the thermal? Well, that, yeah. that's, that's what you wanna to learn to distinguish. So if, if I stick my right wing tip into the, which is this side, if I stick that into the thermal, then it's likely to bump like this. Yeah. But I'll feel it lifting up. And if the thermal is off to that side and I'm flying through some inflow to the thermal, then it's likely to do this and kind of drag me that direction. And in that case, it's more like it's subsiding. It's not a lifting sensation. Um, that's, also, that's, what, that's also going into the thermal or that's falling out? Um, in, in neither case am I in the climb yet, but in, if it, this side lifts, that means I need to circle to the right because it's over here. Yeah. And if this side sinks, that means I need to circle to the left because it's over there. That, that didn't make sense. That seemed to contradict. Uh, so if, 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 it's lifting, if it's lifting here, that's because the thermal is over here. And so I need to circle to the right to stay in it over here. If it's sinking like this, that's because there's an inflow to a thermal over there. And so the thermal is not to my right, it's to my left. So I need to circle the other direction because the thermal is on the other side. Interesting. So I was to distinguish whether that was your left side going down or your right side. That's where you have to be able to tell because in both cases, the glider tilts the same direction. So did it tilt because it, it got lifted up? Or did it tilt because it sort of fell, sank yeah. on that? And I think with, with practice and with that distinction in mind, you can distinguish those in the air. Mm -hmm. Shawnee, I think of the two situations that James is describing, the first one I think is maybe more common, something you'll, you'll just <laughs> be flying and literally one side of your wing will lift. There'll be clear like you've dipped one half of your wing into a river it'll be a very clear sensation of that um the other one you know sometimes too if there's stuff floating like those little fluffy tree things and you see those kind of flying slightly to your right and you're sliding also to the right which was james what was describing that's probably more like that shallow drift and you're being sucked into and towards the thermal and it, it, it takes practice to make that distinction. So be patient with yourself, but um, you'll, you'll get it wrong, but you'll pay attention. And, and after a while, you'll start to get it right more often. Right. Taking uh, the course with Ken, or you've heard about it? Um, I did something with Ken like 20 years ago. Um, and I remember him talking about that. And he's he's such a an uh, passionate madman. I'm sure he's still talking about it. Yes, he is. Yeah, still runs. Course. Yeah, I I took Ken's course. Um, yeah, I did, and it's great because it's it's 
it's very much it's focused on sensation so no instruments whatsoever but you know he'll teach you even like sensing the the pressure on your butt cheek like left a little bit more than right you know things like that and he'll in very practical ways he'll sort of talk about what James was describing on centering and what does your vario sound like as you're trying to find that core. Um, yeah, I thought it was, I mean, it's a classic. So you, you, it help, help your thermaling? Yes. Yeah, take that. Can't see them, right? You just gotta feel them. <laughs> wish we could see, wish we could like color the air like in smoke and see the thermals, you know. <laughs> Wouldn't it get too easy? Yeah, yeah, that's true, we get bored. On the other hand, I'm about to go to Chilean where there are dust devils that you can see miles away. And that's a little bit like coloring the air. In most places, you don't see those. Right. Yeah, far, forest fires too. So there's forest fires and smoke or dust nearby. You'll, you'll start to see them. Interesting. Um, I've never seen it here, but I've seen it in Europe. And it's pretty interesting to see how the world, like just how the air mechanics work. Yeah. James, was there anything else just by looking at your tracks after a flight that you really learned only that way that you probably wouldn't have learned otherwise? Um, I often learned that I fucked around way too long um, or I stayed in lift too long, which I still do sometimes. Um, uh, you know, when, when you're first thermaling, you're so excited to be thermaling that you don't want to leave the lift at all. Like, why would I leave this? I'm still going up at 0 0.007 meters per second. Um, and that's okay. But, um, but if you, if you do that, I mean, if you're in a strong downwind cross country flight, just flying downwind, you can kind of do that. Um, but at some point it's good to get on your bike and go find the next one. And, um, Sometimes I do a lot of, I do too much screwing around with weak lift when I have some altitude. Um, and uh, uh, I had a flight like that a couple of weeks ago. I was trying to fly to a field near Pine Plains that my, my new girlfriend has a piece of land there that she wants to build a house on. And I've never gone there. And flying east from Brace when it's blue and there are no clouds, even if clouds are popping over the Brace Ridge, I've often landed. Um, and, but I haven't gone east as far south as Pine Plains before, but I just wasn't at all confident that I was gonna be able to get there at all. And so I, I climb over launch, the nice clouds there and get to base. And then a cloud pops on the other side of the Brace Valley, the only one all day. And I know she's only like one quarter of the way hiked down the back. So like, I'm gonna be way early, but but I go I go to that cloud and that cloud's a great climb four, four meters per second on the averager. And I should talk about averagers here in a second, but um, on the averager and up to 1800 meters. So now I've got pine planes on glide unless I just get drilled by God and, <laughs> Um, but I know she's not remotely there yet. So, so I go on glide and I get to the field and I'm at 3000 feet. So, wow, that's pretty fun. And then I look around for a, another thermal. There's a hill. Sure enough, it's got to climb. I climb back to 5,000 feet and I call her on the phone to see where she is. And so I'm able to stay in the air until she gets there. So that was fun. But looking at the animation of that, my God, I did a lot of just fucking around and nothing. Um, um, a, a good competition track has very little screwing around. As soon as the climb starts to slow down, you leave and, um, and you just uh, find faith that you're gonna get the next one before you land. And of course, sometimes you don't and that rattles your faith and that's part of the game of competition flying but you can't believe how much the top guys go straight um it's really a lot mm. so 
I learned that a lot. I think the, the, a big thing that I learned looking at tracks though, is what I was talking about looking back down the circles, spin around in Google earth so you can look back down the thermal and see where did that one trigger? And that's pretty interesting because it's very often not a big ridge. It's very often not the brace ridge or some other big ridge. It's like a small hill in the valley. Um, so from there, start to learn to look for those kinds of features. Um, and then with the wind direction and how strong the wind is, how far downwind of that feature do you need to be for how high you are to maybe find something? And it's a lot of guessing, but if you the looking around on Google Earth can help you get much better at guessing, I think. Um, if we are going to look at your screen of when you talk about the averager, can you show how to see the averager on fly sky high? And I, I know this could extend to a long conversation, so don't uh, like, but um, like a two minute view of like what you're looking at while you're flying, if possible. Like, do you have to connect the lines or are you, is it possible to fly? I always see a line on my, on the waypoints if I have it on, even if I'm not flying a task. So I'm just curious what it looks like when it's, when you're flying. Um, this is, this is a good question. Let's talk about the averager first. Um, uh, so let's see, Vario lift in meters per second. So if I have a lift field, like in the upper left here, that's my that's my vario field and the averaging period so I, it'll average from zero which is instantaneous oh. vario, up to 60 seconds now and i tend to keep mine in the 20 to 30 second range i used to be 30 now i'm and this looks like 20 and i think my other instruments at 20. um this isn't the vario that I use for centering. I use the audio for centering and the audio is instant. So okay, so I know I'm the slowest climbs over here. I need to move my circle this way. And I'll actually look over there and I'll say, okay, the mountain's over there. So I'm gonna shift toward the mountain. So I get to here and I extend but only for a second or two. I don't fly straight for 10 seconds because that's gonna put me out of the thermal every time. So um, I use the audio for centering, but when I wanna know how strong the climb is, I don't care what the instant is. I care what the average is over the last 20 seconds. Each circle takes, um, what's his name who wrote the book a couple of years ago that says 16 seconds is ideal. It's going to vary a little bit. You don't have to make all your circles exactly 16 seconds. But if you take 20 seconds, that will average pretty much one solid circle. And there are a lot of thermals where you'll be going up really fast in part of it and then really and then even sinking in the other part and then going up and sinking. And, and it'll feel very dramatic. But it doesn't mean you're going up worth a shit. Um, and the averager tells you how fast you're actually going up. And so that's how you set it in fly sky high. You set the averaging period. If I go and drag this thing, it doesn't seem to give me a readout, but so somewhere like there is around 20 seconds. Um, that's a good value. Are you so, using Bluetooth barrier for this or the Im embedded barrier? Well, or this is, I don't have a Bluetooth connection currently. Yeah. Um, so this is fly sky high's embedded thing. And yeah. it's, it works well enough, but my other instrument with the more sensitive Vario um, also has an averager for the display. Um, uh -huh. And it also has an instant Vario, which um, you can have the instant Vario on display also. I use that on glide more than, but not for climbing. Um, so, uh, the audio will always be instant. Use the audio for centering. Yes. But use an averager to know how strong the climb is. Got it. Cool. 
Okay, so then we're going to talk about one other thing. What was it? Oh, what fields do you want to actually display? And there's a, in Fly Sky High, there's a hundred different things you can have. And a lot of comp pilots go nuts with all the things that they can display. But if you, if you look at what someone like Russ Ogden flies, Russ is Ozone's chief test pilot. He won the Worlds last year. He's always competitive at the top level. He's a superb pilot. He doesn't have very many things that he worries about. One is your speed over ground. Your speed over ground, if, if you know how your glider flies, that tells you a lot about the wind. Because, okay, I'm on, I'm on half bar, so my speed should be 42K, but it's 35K. That, that means I'm, I've got a headwind component of seven kilometers an hour. Um, that kind of math is, is simple and extremely informative about what's going on with the wind. The wind is changing different altitudes, different places on your flight. So that one's really valuable. Um, what your glide over ground is, is really valuable. That tells you a lot about how much you're sinking as well as how much headwind you have. Um, if you're flying into wind, uh, stronger headwind and more sink look exactly the same in terms of where you're going. And it doesn't even matter which one it is really. Um, but what's your glide over ground look like? So that, that, that's important. Instruments have a lot of calculated things like, okay, you've got a waypoint up ahead. The instrument will try to anticipate your altitude. You can have a field, I'm sure Fly Sky High has it, that says anticipated altitude at waypoint. And for that, the instrument is using what's been going on for the last 20 minutes and it's extrapolating from that. And just like every other area of life, extrapolating is dangerous and leads to a lot of wrong answers. I much prefer to know what my glide to goal is or glide to the next waypoint on the ground. And then am I ab above or below that in terms of I've got my glide over ground and my glide to goal next to each other? And how am I doing? And if, if it gets sinky, okay, I need to find another climb because I'm below the glide that's going to get me there. So there are a lot of things you don't you don't need, but uh, the average you're on your Vario, the ground speed, glide over ground, altitude. Those are the big ones. You can get, um, on Fly Sky High, you might want wind speed and wind direction, which the program will calculate pretty well for you. I think Fly Sky High's wind stuff actually works quite well. Um, um, Yeah, I think that's pretty much all you, all you really need. Do you uh, switch between these three as you fly? I'm sorry. Do you switch between th screens as you fly, or you stay on this one screen? I have it set so that it automatically switches to this one. This is the the thermaling assistant. This the 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 top half of this page is the thermaling assistant. So when it notices that I'm circling or climbing it will switch to this page automatically. And then it switches back to this one without me having to do anything. Nice. Fly Sky High has a nice feature, which is it's watching the front side camera. So if you wave your hand, it's not happening here in my dark room, but if, if you, in, in flight, if you wave your gloved hand over the, over the camera, it'll switch pages for you. So you, it's easy to switch pages without having to touch the screen. Um, and if you wanted more fields, you could do that. But um, so that would be the other thing that I use would be the thermaling assistant, which I have on a page like that. Um, oh, cool. and then your I, waypoint loaded without a path between them, right? I'm sorry. Your waypoints, you just have them loaded without having drawn a path between them. Right. Okay. So you were wondering how to make a task. So no. um, if I go to the, to the map page, I can say, okay, um, let's, 
let's start at the brace launch, which is that one, the brace takeoff. So I say, uh, I come down here to the lower left and with the plus nine and tap, and that, that adds that to the task. Let's say that's my next one. I tap on that, add to the task. I think I'm doing the right thing. Okay, and then the next one, hit the get info button and down at the bottom left with the flags, add to the task. And then I can go back and under, and I tap on waypoints in the middle bottom right. And at the top, I, I hit root, there, where it says root, those are the ones I've added to the task. And now I can edit those cylinders and say, okay, I want this one to be a three kilometer cylinder. And now let's look at what that looks like. And this is the zooming thing, but so. I see. That's weird. Somehow I deleted that one from the task. Oh, I know, because you, you only have to touch the cylinder. So yeah, it, it's showing you the direct route to the other one, to the third one, because you'll automatically get the second one on the way. So not the best demonstration, but you get the idea. Yeah, thank you. And if you want to add something that's somewhere else, you can, there's a way to add waypoints. Um, probably in the upper right where there's a flag and a plus sign that would let me add a waypoint. Listen to Tim Pentry's tutorial about this program. Um, if, really you're, if your flight doesn't according to your plan, then isn't it annoying to have that plan in there? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, if you want, you can come into the thing while you're flying, and it, as long as the one that you want to delete isn't the first one, you can come in here and just hit the trash can at the bottom, and now my route only has two waypoints, and looks like that. Um, so it is possible to make adjustments in the air, but when it's busy and when it's turbulent, you just end up not touching anything. So yes, it's not ideal. Um, um, if you're just free flying with no waypoints, um, then fly, fly sky high will show you where to put your next triangle point. Like I was saying, if you want to make an FI, FAI triangle, um, and you definitely don't have to have waypoints on a cross country flight, or you might just have one, like if you want to get to Copake or to, um, uh, right. Egremont or something. Um, I like waypoints, but it's probably because I've flown a lot of competitions and it just kind of helps me feel like I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. Thank you. All right. Well, it's getting late. We've kind of run on. <laughs> Thank you guys yeah. for your attention. Um, and Thanks, James. Thanks so much. The, the uh, I'll leave the Google the Google Doc page up and um, maybe add something to it sometime. And maybe I'll move it to Roland's wiki, or maybe I'll just put a link on the wiki to that page because it's easy to edit there. Um, and I'll, I'll add it to our New York uh, Flyers uh, WhatsApp too, so people can. Add it. I'm sorry. I'll add it to the WhatsApp uh, chat group too. So oh, okay. Copy it from. Oh, there. and then I had another thought, which is Zoom's making a recording, so I'll I'll load the recording. Um, 
uh, I'll upload that to YouTube and I'll put a link uh, on the page also in, in case you really have to hear this again, you can. <laughs> I missed yeah. the first part, so I'll, I'll want to come back and, and review. So thanks for posting that. Okay, you bet. Thank you for dedicating the time and coming so prepared. My pleasure. Good fun. And I'll see you guys on the Hill. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much, James. It was really super informative. And I hope everybody's buying a beer next time they see you. Definitely. Yes. If we can catch him. <laughs>